uh, when we were opening at the Young Vic uh, in March 2018, uh, I went out and had a cigarette thinking, what the hell is going to happen tonight? Welcome to Newsweek Conversations. We're here at Media Math today. Thank you very much for hosting us. Um, I'm here with Kyle Sola, who is the lead at the hottest play on Broadway at the moment. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> the best play on Broadway, The Inheritance. I mean, it, it is getting incredible critical acclaim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And uh, you've come to us on your day off. Yes. Which I understand is relatively exhausting. <laughs> I mean, the day the off is exhausting. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the schedule. I mean, you're on a pretty rampant. It's a seven-hour play. Yeah, yeah. It's about six and a half hours, and um, sorry, I'm six and a half. Well, no, no. Yeah, it, I'm sure it does feel like seven, but um, <laughs> I'm in about six of those six and a half, and um, yeah, on my on my days off, um, I, I practice pretty aggressive self-care, and spend most of it horizontal so right so I'm very this grateful a rare appearance on a that Monday. <laughs> we're not horizontal today <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're here with us exactly. um, seven hours six and a half hours is still a long time um, do you do you think and and people are going like people who see the first episode first part yeah first season yeah uh, by and large go see the second um, yeah there was even a very interesting phenomenon, I guess, that happened in London, the people that had only bought a part one ticket for a matinee, um, come the evening show, there would be a line around the block to come and see part two. Right. And I think six and a half hours is daunting to, to undertake doing anything, but um, sitting in a theater and experiencing um, a very emotional drama is, um, is, is quite daunting. So. Um, but I think if you give part one a chance, you are hooked and you can't not see part two. It just is written with such heart and warmth and hilarity and uh, it moves along really quickly. A lot of the people I meet um, at stage doors say, I was ready for part three. What yeah. Part three. And I <laughs> say, just go home. <laughs> Please. Do you We're think, done. but do you think that's partly because of? <clears throat> Netflix and binge watching. I mean, people now, I mean, a movie of two or three hours was considered fairly long, mm. but now people see these series where there are 13 episodes and they watch them back to back or over two or three days or three days. And there's. Oh, God, yeah. And do you think that's helped? The yeah, well, it was it, I think it was like Noel Coward that um, famously said that a, a play or entertainment should be in accordance with people's bladders and it should, should sort of accommodate for that. So like in every hour there should be a break or an interval or something. And in, in fact, we do, we do abide by that, <laughs> uh, funnily enough. But um, certainly we are living in a, in a time where more is better, um, whether you agree with that or not. Um, but that has built up viewers endurance and um, for this play I mean that's the best possible scenario yeah, yeah that absolutely is. so they they really do eat it up and it's yeah. yeah it's it's amazing to experience so if someone's going to come and see the play what's the one thing they should know about it what's the one sort of tagline or idea that you would give them about the play to say I suppose the most important thing to know is that it's an it's inspired by Howard's End, which was written by E.M. Yeah. E. Forster. And um, it's been, the story has been transplanted to modern day New York. Um, and instead of the striated class system in England, in Edwardian England, it is gay Manhattanites trying to figure out who they are and where they're going. But the play appeals to a vastly broader audience than the uh, LGBTQ yes. community. Yes, it, it was written by a member of that community for that community, yeah. for um, and for for himself and for so many other people. But it grapples with a lot of universal questions that humans have been grappling with since they could come up with questions. Why are we here? Um, what is my responsibility to my fellow, fellow human? How can I live in this world trying to be good with all of the chaos 
that surrounds me. And, um, and it's incredibly brave and it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's hilarious in equal measure, I think. And I think that, that's one of the other things that really struck me about it is that, so it's, uh, you know, the, the, a big theme in it is the gay plague, the AIDS in the 80s, right? And yet, it's funny. I mean, the, I mean, that's not funny, <laughs> obviously. But yeah. there are moments in the play that are, the whole place erupts in laughter. And oh yeah, multiple times. Yeah, and yeah. I think if you, it's not, it's not. I mean, it's heavy in parts, but then it's lightened right up again. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you had um, a play last for six and a half hours, that was just uh, soul wrenching drama. <laughs> <laughs> I think our run would be a lot shorter. I think we probably would have appeared for maybe a couple of weeks as a sort of European import, but like um, at St. Anne's or something. Um, so like part of that is, is the genius of Matthew Lopez, who is, he writes funny unlike any playwright I've ever read. Now I've not read every playwright, but he's certainly the one I've come across where I just go, wow, I don't know how you did that. And um, and the play bounces along on, on these releases of tension, which are yeah. these laughs that are interspersed throughout the entire six and a half hours, yeah. even in some of the more emotional moments. And you need that levity in order to bring your soul back up. Yeah. Now, it's an American play, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you started in the West End in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that part of some master plan to, I mean, what, w why not start here? Was, I mean, what was, what well, was the thing, was the thinking, you know, we know we're going to be so popular, so we'd be popular there first and then move it over <laughs> here. I'll win an Olivia award. And, wow. uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to think everyone had that foresight, but <laughs> no. I mean, I, I know opening it in, in London afforded a kind of, you do soft openings for restaurants or yeah. for galleries and stuff. Yeah. And I think in, in, a, in a way, that's not to detract from the importance of a London opening, but I think what it afforded Matthew was, and Stephen and Justin, was um, a safer space to work on it with, without America sitting right on top of it. It allowed us to find it in London and figure out what the play was in two different iterations. And the way that Stephen and Justin and Matthew worked on this play was to change it every time. So I was gonna ask, there were changes from the opening night to yeah. what we see today. Oh my God, so I got, um, we got some new lines on opening day in at the Young Vic. I got a new speech the night before opening day oh in the West End. So there, there is stuff that's in the Broadway version that was not in the West End. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, there's stuff that, you know, the, the guys who have been with it from the beginning that, that we kind of miss and there's stuff we can't even remember because we have three different versions in our heads. But um, I mean, 80% of the play is, is the same. Yeah, but, I'm sure. But the, the smaller things add up to make it a very different experience, I think. Um, an audience member might disagree, but, but to me, they're very different shows. And even here, uh, there's a guy on um, Sunday. That's yesterday, right? Um, that is yesterday. Uh, it was his ninth time seeing it. And we only opened, wow. we started previewing at the end of September. Yeah. Did, did we you have know people, him? Did he come up and talk to you? How did yeah, you know? yeah. He, yeah. He just, uh, he sort of led After with that. After the seventh like, this time, is my he's ninth like, time. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you're incredible. That's like more than a day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we, there are, people who saw the show in London multiple times that have come over to Broadway to see it. I think it creates a communion between the audience and the players, unlike anything I've experienced. In terms of the themes of the play, the, the theater becomes a, a space of learning, a space of healing, a space of grieving, um, a space of play, of um, excitement and over the course of six and a half hours when the fourth wall between the audience and the actors is constantly being broken we can really hear them being vocal and gasping and laughing and sobbing and um, 
And I, I think it, and we see people holding each other at the end of the performances, yeah. strangers that are sitting, yeah. sitting next to them. Yeah. And that kind of visceral experience, I've just never seen that in the theater. Yeah. What is that like? I mean, I know when we went to see it, um, the end of the first part, everyone's weeping openly pretty much. And I got to yeah. imagine that that's the same most nights. I don't think that Every our night, night yeah. was. How's that for you, holding people like that uh, at the end of the first? I mean, that must be incredibly emotionally draining. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's the reason you spend Mondays horizontal. <laughs> yeah, and most of Tuesday. But um, it's uh, it's really incredible. It, it that that's when the play stops being theater. Yeah, and something else happens. And I thought maybe that would wear off after a while, and it doesn't seem like it will. It, it becomes a, a really um, otherworldly space. And so you are as in it every time. It's not, yeah. it's not something that I, weirdly, the first time you're in it, the tenth time you're in it a little less, and by the time you've done the 40th, you're not. I, I think the way that the play has been constructed up until that point in my character's specific journey, I, I don't have to do anything in, in, in that scene. It's enough, the way that it's written and what happens is just um, really profound. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, I feel the audience feeling it. Is there a difference between the English and the American audiences? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> What's the difference? Yeah. Um, we had to rework some things. Um, Oh, what because, worked? What worked in one place and didn't work yeah, in the other? Yeah, 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 and, and and vice versa. So there were there were things that because we created the play over there. Yeah. There were things that um, we crafted the laughs to happen certain ways over there, and yeah. and there's an English sense of humor that. Yeah. Um, I think a which lot is of, fabulous, which is incredible. <laughs> you know, the best. <laughs> but uh, there were there were a lot of shall we say like, I don't know, um, comedy moments that are built on kind of. Gosh, just brilliant, brilliant um, English comedy. So the best. So what, like Laurel and Hardy and yeah. Richard Curtis and you know Mr. Bean and sort of slapsticky moments that kind of um, are are from the great British tradition. And some of those things didn't quite work over here, so we had to slightly tweak them for whatever reason. Don't yeah. know why. Um, but then conversely, all the mentions about property and real estate sort of got kind of hmms and ahs in, in London. But as soon as you mention um, in the scene where Henry Wil Wilcox gives Eric Glass an apartment and uh, he says, it comes with a key. And Eric says, well, I should hope so. He says, no, numbskull, a key to the park. And over in London, it was just crickets. But over here, last Wednesday, he said, no, numbskull, a key to the park. And in the front row, this gay couple just went, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> just like that loud. And every, every time, it's just people go, oh, no. And um, Matthew told me that um, a couple weeks ago, he was sitting in, and there was an older woman in the back that just went, take it, honey, take it. <laughs> so um, they're just vocal in a different way over here. And... Um, and, and yeah, so it was very interesting trying to... Um, well, it's set here and the audience is, the, you know, so it's going to, there are going to be inside things, I guess. That, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you, I guess, um, Stephen and Matthew and Justin had to decide whether to roll with that um, New York sensibility yeah. or not. And I think they split the difference in a very confident way. So I have a couple of questions that sort of come out of the experience of seeing the play. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is that uh, despite the fact that I'm just as young as you and I've got a beard just like you and I'm just as good looking, <laughs> we're actually opposites. You've got better glasses. Than <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, they match my tie too, by the way. You dress better too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, um, you're, you're an American who's moved to the UK. Mm -hmm. You're married an English woman. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, left the UK a long, long time ago in a little part, actually, to escape the class system. I didn't like it um, uh, to come here. Um, I didn't marry an American, married an Australian, but still. <laughs> um, has, has the play caused you to make any observations about class?
class systems in England or the United States, or has it caused yeah. you to think about that at all? Yeah, I think the class system is alive and kicking in, in the UK, certainly. And it extends to every level in the workplace. And, um, and I, I didn't ever really think there was a class system in America until I moved to England and really became aware of what I think in your face class system was, <laughs> you know? And, um, and by the way, I can tell you it's better today than it was when I left. I bet. You know, I, I left bet. in 1978 and it's way wow. better today than it is. Yeah. Was then. I can't imagine actually, yeah. I think um, Forster's novel and what he was trying to accomplish is, is, was incredible to have been written when it was written at yeah. the turn of the century, right. of the 20th century. And the fact that Matthew managed to bring that story up to date and set it in Manhattan and go, yeah, but look at it now. <laughs> Through, through the veil of gay New Yorkers is just a testament that like, what a class system there is here. Yeah. One of the themes of the play is about um, how your history, your individual personalized history, what it is and, and knowing how your history has affected your life. Um, uh, how, is there something about, you know, something that you've learned about your own personal history that's affected your life today? I mean, my family's history, my, my grandpa left Germany with his brother, I think when he was like 16, and um, escaped that country because of where it was headed and yeah. moved to New York. And I'm, I don't know, I wonder whether maybe that kind of spirit forced an escape from myself to London for right, right. different reasons. Yeah. But um, and I, but I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are many, yeah, yeah. <laughs> many. I think, I, I think it's a, a truth about the play is that whether you know it or not, the things that have affected you in your past are affecting you today. I met an older gentleman at the stage door who, um, remarkably mirrored one of the characters in the play. He'd been married to his husband for 36 years. Um, has two children from his husband's previous marriage, and he lost every single one of his friends in the epidemic. Yeah. And he said, I have seen every play to deal with this subject, and this is the first time I feel like my story is being told, and it's the best it's ever been told. Now, that is not to detract from the, the plethora of plays and literature from the LGBTQ community that has come before Matthew's play. Matthew is indebted to those um, novels, books, plays, um, but, and, he, and he is very openly indebted to them within the inheritance. But there is just something about this particular story, Matthew's genius, melding with E.M. Forster's genius, um, where something really special and incredible has happened. But I think specifically, I mean, if you are on Truvada today, I'd be broke. I can't afford it. Right. And I make a living as an actor. Right. And that's unreal. The fact that ACT UP, fight for AIDS, accomplished so much at the cost of so many lives in the 80s and the 90s, and there's still no affordable medication. And there, this, this kind of crazy disconnect is, I think, one of the things Matthew's trying to explore in the play, which is the generation that lived through it, that lost so many people yeah. and the generation that's come after it who can openly and freely on any kind of social media profess who they are who they love um walk down the street holding hands and you go well do you understand what was sacrificed in order to make that happen 
And how do you bring those two generations together, heal those wounds in order to forge a better future? Yeah. Um, at, uh, when, you, when you go to see the play, you're given this flyer, which I'll just hold up for the camera here. Um, and uh, uh, in the flyer, it says, um, tell us about someone who has impacted your life by helping you understand who you truly are and ask you to share it on this uh, website. So uh, I think it's only fair for me to ask you, as every <coughs> audience member is being asked, um, who is someone who has really impacted your life and, and helped you understand who you truly are? Oh, man. Um, my parents, I bet everybody says that, but I think they really... I, I, I was a child who was um, luckily good at a lot of different things, yep. and they um, really encouraged that and allowed me to explore and make mistakes, but also... Um, really hone those passions. And, um, and I, I think that they are incredibly responsible for me sitting with you right now. I think they realized that this was, acting was something that I maybe should focus on. And I think that was really incredible. As a parent, I can tell you that's not easy to do. Yeah. So, yeah Cause acting is not an easy profession. So no, no. And, and yeah, they could have discouraged me or, um, or just approached it in, in, in the wrong yeah. way, but they'd always been so supportive. Even when I moved over to London to study and, um, yeah, there are 500 other people I could mention in this comment, <laughs> but I, I should say, I should say them. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs>